Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Pat McCormick, President of the City Club, and I'd like to welcome members and guests alike, those of you joining us here in the Governor Hotel, and those of you watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Today, we're in for a real treat. We'll be enjoying musical selections from the Portland State Chamber Choir. But first, some announcements. The support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures that we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Our partners are essential to the vitality and sustainability of the club's activities. I'd like to thank our generous media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and our Friday Forum fall corporate sponsors, AARP, Portland General Electric, and Perkins Coie. We're grateful for your support and commitment to the City Club's mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause. We have just a couple of spots left for the spring sponsorships. Our winter sponsorships are already filled. If your company or firm would like to support City Club's mission through sponsorship, please contact the friendly staff at the back of the room or contact the City Club office. We will be not be having Friday forums on December 21st, December 28th, or January 4th. The next Friday forum we'll have will be on January 11th, when we'll hear from John Russell, founder of Russell Development, with a talk about the state of Portland's urban planning. The program will be moderated by Brian Libby, a noted Portland freelance journalist specializing in architecture. You can learn more about future City Club events on our website, pdxcityclub.org. We will be having a question and answer session at the end of today's program with the choir. City Club members, please come to the microphone to ask your question. For all our audience members, please locate the index cards on the center of your tables and write your questions on them during the program. We will collect them prior to the start of the question and answer period. Also on your table are feedback forums for our forum today. City Club values your input and we want to make sure that we are putting on the best Friday forums we can. Please complete those forms and staff will collect them at the end of the forum. There are also envelopes there available for you for convenience in sharing your annual fund contributions. And now for our program. We're glad you're all here for the City Club's annual holiday show. We're pleased to welcome the internationally recognized Portland State Chamber Choir. With song and commentary, they hope to spark a discussion about the future of music and music education. Their program will also include selections from their newly released album, A Drop in the Ocean, which was, has received broad acclaim throughout the U.S. choral community. The conductor for the chamber choir is Dr. Ethan Sperry. The Portland State Chamber Choir was founded in 1976. Since that time, the choir has performed at many prestigious venues, touring internationally and singing in the United States by invitation at national conventions for the Music Educators National Conference, the American Choral Directors Association, and the Society of International Music Educa Educators. This year, the Chamber Choir became the first American choir since 2007 to be selected to compete in the International Grand Prix for Choirs in St. Petersburg, Russia. And without further ado, please help me welcome Ethan Sperry and the Portland State Chamber Choir. Good afternoon. It's a, a real honor to be here at the City Club, and on a personal note, I really enjoy listening to these uh, forums Fridays at noon. I actually uh, have that hour free every once in a while, and it, it's just truly fascinating topics, and it's great to see an organization taking such a pressing interest in the key issues of our time and, and sharing them in this kind of a format. Um, we have uh, a few things on our agenda today, but we understand that on Sunday is a very important birthday for the president of uh, your city club, Pat. He's uh, finally turning 30, so we'd like to wish him a happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. 
we're here uh, mainly to perform for you because it's the holiday season, but also to talk a little bit about something that is very important to all of us, which is uh, the future of music education uh, in our country and especially in our city. You may not know this, but Portland State uh, has grown very rapidly in the past decade, and not just the university, but the music uh, department. We now have over 400 students studying music at Portland State University as their major, which makes us the largest music program in the Northwest of the United States. Um, we are also the largest music education program in the Northwest of the United States, graduating more future music teachers with uh, licenses than any other school in this area and especially after the passage of uh, the recent uh, levy, which will uh, allow music and art to return to all of the schools in Portland, I think will uh, really be supplying uh, the largest share of music teachers in this area. A statistic that's not known about Portland State, and especially about this choir, it's a very special group, and you heard some of our accolades, and I can take very little credit for that. This is only my third year in charge of the choral program at Portland State University. But about a decade ago, the New York Times did a study tracking what happens to Juilliard graduates. And they looked at people who had graduated from Juilliard 10 years after they had graduated and found that less than 10% of them were actually still pursuing careers in the degrees for which they had gone to Juilliard for in the first place. Um, I stumbled on this because I, we did an alumni reunion for this chamber choir, inviting back any alums who had sung in the group since 1976. And to the best of our ability to track them, we think that over 50% of the graduates of this group are still pursuing careers in music. So. And I think it says something about the music program at Portland State, uh, but also maybe about a, a, a larger state-run uh, response to music or seeing things uh, for the future of music as being more than just performance. Uh, over 100 of our uh, music majors at Portland State study jazz, over 100 study voice, and then 200 cover the rest of the instruments you might uh, normally see in an orchestra or a band or music composition or piano or guitar. It's a very wide-ranging program, but if you look at what our graduates do, many are performers, sung, of, sung at the Metropolitan Opera and still sing at the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, if you want to see the, the movie version of The Tempest that was just broadcast by the Metropolitan Opera, that new world premiere, the soprano lead is a graduate of Portland State and of this choir. Um, and then you look at uh, this area and you find that most of the music teachers uh, in this area have gone to Portland State. And the people that run Oregon Catholic Press and do a lot of that music, which is one of the largest sheet music publishers that's independent in the United States, and those people went to Portland State. And you look at the people that teach voice and uh, run the choirs in universities around here, including at the University of Washington, and you find that they went to Portland State. And uh, for me, in my knowledge of the school when I took over as a faculty position, I really find this quite amazing until you get to see what the students can do. And then you understand it, that I think we're providing something very special and allowing the residents of this area of the country sort of a flagship place to come together. Um, I think a lot of people choose Portland State because they either don't want to or can't afford to leave the region to go to school. And maybe that's not the best reason to choose a place to go, but it brings all sorts of talent together in a very special way. And what we expect of them at Portland State, even if they're studying a classical degree, is to be able to present as wide a variety of music in as stylistically a correct way as possible. And I think this is more true of the Northwest and especially Portland State, that even if you're a classical vocalist here, we expect you to be able to sing in any style that we can throw at you. And if you see the people who are at the top of the field in the classical world these days, especially, for example, Yo-Yo Ma, um, his repertoire reaches far beyond just performing the Dvorak Cello Concerto into the music of the Silk Road and to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon and Baroque pieces and, and uh, tangos from Brazil and all of these albums he's recorded. We're gonna take a similar approach to you, uh, for you today in what we sing. Every piece we're going to sing is going to be in a remarkably different style. And hopefully this sheds a little light on, on maybe what the future of music needs to look like. Less of the divisions, this is classical music, this is pop music, I do this or I do that. But this is music and if I'm going to be a musician, my job is to understand what was written by different people in different places in different times and bring that to life. So our first piece was written last year by a young composer in Latvia, who I think is truly amazing, and will be in Portland here later this year. He's writing a piece for this choir, and will also be uh, working with the Oregon Repertory Singers in the uh, first per uh, performance of his first major oratorio in the United States. Um, this is a piece called O Salutaris Hostia, 
It's a traditional liturgical prayer asking for God to protect our homeland in times of war. And it features two soprano soloists. And uh, today we will actually be featuring a pair of sisters who sing in this choir uh, from Newburgh, Hannah Consens and Rachel Consens. So enjoy O Salutaris Hostia by Eric Essenwalds. We're going to sing uh, two pieces of classical music on similar texts, but written in dramatically different times. One of the uh, great accomplishments a, co a composer can hope for in their life, especially if they're religious, is to set to music the Vesper service, the evening worship service that used to have more prominence in our society than the mass, uh, which is sort of what people go to, go to today. Um, one of these is a setting by Claudio Monteverdi, uh, the composer who lived at the end of the Renaissance and sort of ushered in the Baroque period. And he wrote an entire setting of the evening Vesper service where every single movement, every prayer was set to music for a different set of performing forces. <clears throat> and uh, we don't know why he wrote it. We don't have any evidence that it was performed during his lifetime at all. 
but it was almost just him wanting to have down on paper the ability of what you can do. And I've selected just the, the hardest movement of this for choir, because it's actually written for triple choir, where we have uh, a choir over here of sopranos, altos, and basses, and a choir over there of sopranos and altos and basses, and the poor tenors clustered by themselves in the, the middle uh, as a choir by themselves. And it's a setting of the Lauda Jerusalem, the, uh, the praising and the singing that will happen when we enter the, the holy city of Jerusalem. And, uh, the tenors sort of hold on to the main melody, and these two choirs accompany them, and uh, there's a lot of math in this music. You'll hear a very clear call and response between these two choirs at the beginning, and then these things begin to overlap until they're singing exactly the same music, one measure apart, and then two beats apart, and then one beat apart, until everything finally comes together and we're able to sing the Gloria Patri, the doxology, as one large choir. So this is the Lauda Jerusalem from Monteverdi's Vespers. Another composer who set the entire evening service to music is the great Russian romantic composer Sergei Rachmaninoff. 
and it's an unusual choice for him because he spent most of his life writing piano music and orchestral music and wrote very little vocal or choral music at all. And to go from that to writing a, a piece that's over an hour long, setting all 15 of the Russian Orthodox evening prayers to music, uh, is a strange choice. And you'll hear the way he conceives of the choir is much more like an orchestra, where different sections take lead roles and accompanying roles, and the melodies get passed around from area to area. And again, we're performing just the, uh, the most difficult of the 15 movements. Um, and this is the story of uh, the angels appearing to the people who are going to Christ's tomb after he's been laid there. Uh, and the angels are saying, why are you crying? Don't you realize there's no one there? We have conquered death. Um, so this may not be the story of the re resurrection, but the story of how people come to find it out. And uh, you'll hear a recurring theme sung by the men at the beginning of this piece, blessed art thou, O Lord, uh, teach me thy statutes. And so the choir goes from the role of the people wishing to learn the story to taking on the role of the people telling the story and having to go back and forth between these two roles. So this is the ninth movement of Rachmaninoff's Vespers.
We're actually going to sing a piece in English now, <clears throat> and uh, even more interesting because the poem that it originally sets was uh, in Spanish, but the composer, a young American composer named Eric Whitaker, uh, wanted it to be translated into English because he was American and wanted it to speak to the audience here. It's only a three-line poem. Uh, the words go by very slowly. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the text so you can hear it. It's a wonderful poem written by Octavio Paz, a, a Mexican poet who won the Nobel Prize for Poetry in the 1970s. And uh, it ties into the rest of our pieces. Uh, you're hearing the beginning of a set that we're going to present at the Music Educators Conference, uh, which is actually here in Portland uh, this year in February. All these pieces present uh, different views of what might happen to us after we die. You've heard a, a couple of the religious ones, which are more traditional. This is a three-line poem called A Boy and a Girl. Uh, stretched out on the beach, or sorry, stretched out on the grass, a boy and a girl, savoring their oranges, giving their kisses, like waves exchanging foam. Stretched out on the beach, a boy and a girl, savoring their limes, giving their kisses, like clouds exchanging foam. Stretched out underground, a boy and a girl, saying nothing never kissing, giving silence for silence. The idea that we could be united with the person we're meant to be with for eternity.
and uh, now we're going to move uh, more into the uh, pop genre here for a minute. Leonard Cohen was in town a, a couple of weeks ago, and his most, most famous song is uh, The Hallelujah. And there was actually a piece on NPR just last week on All Things Considered about how this uh, piece has been covered hundreds of different times, and I guess that makes us 101 or 201 or whatever, but our version is much better than all of the other uh, versions you've heard. So this is our version of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. Well, I heard there was a sacred chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do ya? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall and the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah, hallelujah. Say I took the name in vain, but I don't even know the name. But if I did, well, really, what's in to ya? There's a blaze of light, and the world, it doesn't matter how much you learn. The holy oil, hallelujah, My best, it wasn't much. I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. I told the truth, I didn't come to fool ya.
So I'm not really a very nice person when it comes down to it. Uh, when Carla invited us to be here today, she asked if we could do some holiday selections because this is that time of the year. And we don't ever sing those. Uh, we're, we've been out of school for over a week. All these people are giving up some of their summer vacation time and all that kind of stuff. And we don't present holiday programs. But as I said, there, there's something to be said for what we expect students here to be able to do. We're going to sing two Christmas carols for you. They're lesser known ones. And they saw the music at 10.30 this morning for the first time when we got here today. So the theory is, you know, are we training people well enough that they should be able to do this? And completely, you, there's no way you should be able to know this, that we're just sight reading these things for you. And I'm not going to tell you that, so we'll see how this <laughs> works afterwards as a double-blind experiment. Uh, I, I, I'm Jewish personally, and I make a claim to know more Christmas carols than any other living Jew. <laughs> And so when it gets to picking out things for this, I can go a little more extreme. Uh, this first one is one of my favorite uh, carols uh, from the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance. It's called the Coventry Carol. And uh, now we have a uh, version of the Carol of the Bells done up as sort of a pop song, pop a cappella, sort of like my, you might see on the show Glee. Uh, but when I do pop songs with choirs, and I think it's important we all learn to, to sing in that style too, I prefer ones where the whole choir gets to sing instead of one soloist standing out front with a, a backup band. So we're going to try and be the choir and the backup band and the soloist all uh, rolled into one. So this is the Carol of the Bells, sort of.
that's a kind of a fun thing. We're not going to rehearse anymore. We're just going to start learning all of our music <laughs> one hour before performances. Uh, we have one more piece for you, and then we'll let you ask some questions uh, if you have any. Um, but another agenda of mine personally is, is taking music from non-Western cultures, cultures that don't necessarily have a tradition of choral singing, but making that music available uh, for, uh, for Westerners to sing. Translating, it's sort of like we just did with that pop song, the voices taking on the roles of instruments or sometimes using instruments. And uh, I think two ways to really learn about another culture, one is to eat the food from that culture and the other one is to experience the music. And it's one thing to go and listen and it's another one to do it actively. And I've done a lot of work myself uh, writing arrangements of music from India for choirs to sing. And uh, I guess if the, uh, the New York Jew can write music for India for choirs to sing, I met a soulmate in this man, Sten Kaelman, who's from Sweden, but writes uh, arrangements of music from Haiti to be sung by choirs. And uh, this resonates perfectly well for us here because uh, this piece is called Gede Nibo, which is the voodoo spirit who appears on the cover of the Voodoo Donuts donut box. Um, <laughs> So it's a very Portlandy uh, piece, but it, it fits the end of our program of what might happen to us after we die. Uh, the voodoo religion, as I understand it, and as I've seen it in Guadeloupe and in Haiti, is not as pictured uh, here in the donut shop or on TV. Um, most Haitians are Catholic, and the voodoo spirits sort of take on the role of the Catholic saints, people that you appeal to on a personal basis. And uh, Gede Nibo is that skeleton with the top hat we see that some people think of as the Grim Reaper. But in voodoo tradition, he's really the person you talk to to get from this life to the next life. And he's the pe person that's featured at all those New Orleans funeral parades where you know there's a very slow, mournful part, and then the funeral parade actually turns into a party where we get that sort of upbeat knowing that that transition has occurred. So this arrangement uh, is done in the same way of uh, us talking to Gede Nibo first in a slower, more somber mood, and then in a faster, more festive mood.
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a great and energetic opportunity to just begin the celebration of the holiday season and for the personalized nature of the way you started it. I personally want to thank you as well. It's time for questions and, and uh, if you have a written question on an index card, please hold it up high so that City Club staff can collect it from you now. The first question for our speaker as always will be from today's Friday Forum host, Ken Ray. Ken is a senior public affairs coordinator at Metro. He's been a City Club member for more than 10 years and has participated in the new Leaders Council, Friday Forum Committees, our ballot measure study committees, as well as serving on our Board of Governors. Ken? Thank you, all of you, for sharing your music and your talents with all of us today. I'd like to ask a question uh, for two of the choir members to answer, and you can choose among yourselves who will come to the microphones to answer this question. I would like for you to describe for us what your involvement, and describe very briefly, what your involvement in Portland State's choral music program brings into your life other than college credit or career preparation. And I said two of you can choose to answer this. And then I have also a follow-up question for Dr. Sperry. Do you have advice for those in our broader statewide audience who either sang in uh, choir when they were in college or adults who have never sung in a choral music program, what's the best advice you would give them to bring choral music into their lives at this, part, at this point in their lives? But first we'll hear from the students. Hello, my name is Carl Moe. Uh, I've had the most consecutive years in this, in the current chamber choir of any of the members. And, um, and so my large ensemble credits for my major are taken care of, and they were about two years ago. <laughs> so I've just continued to do it because it's, the, uh, it's my community at PSU. Uh, PSU being a commuter school, it's kind of difficult to establish kind of a firm uh, grounding with a, with a group of people because we're all all over the place and we come in at different times and it's just kind of difficult. But Chamber Choir meets the same time, three times a week. I see these people more than anyone else at PSU and I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> but um, yeah, in terms of my schooling at PSU, uh, you know, singing in choir, like I'm trying to get a performance degree and sing grand opera and all of that and be a soloist, but singing choir, uh, it's like eating candy. It's, uh, it's just good. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Johnny Roberts. I'm in my second year at PSU. And for me, music has always been an incredible part of my life. Uh, my nickname at home used to be J-Pod because my parents couldn't find the off switch. <laughs> but coming into the PSU Chamber Choir, I got to meet so many incredible people, so many people that have personally influenced me to keep, one, doing better and to improve myself and to just keep on keeping on. And being with Ethan Sperry and being with all these people, I have made some of the most incredible music I have ever heard in my entire life. And to me, that's, it's one of the most beautiful things that in my opinion, music speaks to everyone, no matter what language you speak, no matter where you come from, music will always be the language that can communicate. So for people who already have choir in, in their lives, and I know a lot of adults do, um, I agree with what the student said. The having a community outside of your family and your workplace and the people that you sing with, you always share something important when you perform not as a soloist, but as part of a group. I think you share a very meaningful connection with people. And choir is different than orchestra or band because anyone can sing, everybody has a voice. And we have choirs all over the city uh, that require no audition, up through ones that have very selective auditions. But if you want to be part of a choir, it's generally very, very easy to do. And you will find a community at a church or a community center or a synagogue or all sorts of places where you will find yourself really welcomed because people that sing in choirs want everybody to sing. 
they get what I'm talking about. And I honestly, I put this on my syllabus that there's five reasons to be in, in a choir. And the fifth one is that it, you become a better person. And I really believe that. You become a better singer, you become a better musician, uh, but you really become a better person. In ancient Greece, uh, Aristotle describes three subjects that he believes should be taught in school. One is philosophy, to train the mind. The second is athletics, to train the body. And the third is music, to train the soul. And by those standards, all of our curriculum falls under the first third of what he thought was important. And we fortunately live in a city where the people just voted to restore music and art as part of the core of what's going on. But the thought that it, it ever wasn't um, puts us a long way away from maybe the civilization that we, we've based ourselves on. Um, so give it a try. It's really not as hard. There's really no reason to be afraid, and especially for those of us with stage fright. Um, I deal with it by facing the wrong way during all of the concerts. Um, but when you're in a choir, it's, it's a very different experience to have all those people around you who are your friends up there on stage with you and it not just all falling on your shoulders. Um, I was apparently given, I was told there were a lot of cards like this. What are your other future performances and are there any in the next few weeks? And the short answer to the second one is no, because we're all on winter vacation. And in fact, they all came back from winter vacation to do this today, because we thought it was important. Um, uh, our next performance is in uh, late February. We're combining with the other two auditioned uh, choirs at Portland State and our orchestra to do the Mozart Requiem at First United Methodist Church in, in late February. And in June, all the Portland State choirs will present a concert called Global Rhythms of music from a variety of different cultures uh, around the world. And in May, uh, I think we've just decided that we're gonna do this, and I'd love any one of your help. There's a piece that won the Pulitzer Prize a couple years ago in music called The Little Match Girl Passion by David Lang from New York. And it's Hans Christian Andersen's story of The Little Match Girl, a very, very sad story about the impact of poverty on children and he recasts it as a passion play with the girl taking on the role of, of Christ in the passion story. And it's something we want to do as an outreach to uh, support any causes in the city that are dealing with poverty, with homelessness, maybe with youth violence. And if there's a way this group can be a little more than just a concert giving group but up around the city, if you work with these kinds of causes, we're interested in those kinds of, uh, of partnerships. So that would be coming up in May. Um, it's very easy to find our concerts if you go to the music department's website at Portland State or our website, which is psuchamberchoir.com. And my most shameless answer is we actually have some CDs for sale too. Uh, if you want, you don't have to go to a concert. You could just buy one of those and, and support us. We sell them for $15 or five for $50 if you want to just do all the rest of your Christmas shopping <laughs> that's left undone right now. And if you want to do that, just find Megan. She'll be hanging out probably by the bar over there uh, after, <laughs> after we're done. And yes, I meant that sort of the way it came out, unfortunately. So, <laughs> Thank you. We'll now take questions from the floor, and City Club staff uh, have collected index cards. Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a privilege of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and uh, ask it as quickly as possible. I don't see anybody standing at the microphone, so let me ask one of the questions from the index cards. First of the questions that I was going to ask uh, so will you sing at my wake? I didn't know whether they were asking that since you sang my birthday song, you sing at my personal wake, but somebody else was looking for that. Um, in your music education... Which piece? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> in your music education curriculum, what can you do about rhythmic, the rhythmically challenged? Are we all educable about music? Yes. <laughs> It, it really just is, does take practice, and for me, finding the right pitch, finding the right rhythm is very similar to riding a bicycle. For a lot of people, it's very counterintuitive at first, and it may take a while, and I didn't learn to ride a bike till I was eight, despite endless amounts of work by my parents. But just like anything else, it's a matter of persistence and maybe finding a good teacher. But it tends to be one of those things that eventually just clicks for most people. And frankly, a lot of people in choir learn by osmosis. You just stand around good people and you just figure out how to do it. But like other skills like this, for some of us it's very intuitive and for others it takes a lot of practice. But everybody really is teachable and I've taught at all sorts of levels and I have yet to run into anyone that I haven't been able to teach uh, to match pitch. And I've worked with many who haven't. Well, let me ask one last question. It just uh, You mentioned Glee in your comments. How has Glee as a program changed the nature of choirs and choral groups? Do people feel more cool being part of a club? 
It means that all choir singers are in the same place every Wednesday night watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. We appreciate your taking the time to be with us for the holiday season. We are adjourned for the day. Thank you. Thank you very much for seeing